Welcome, everyone. Great to see um, people here in the room, but also people um, online. We're figuring that out still, but we'll be there. Um, my name is Susanne Schmeier. Um, I'm just uh, helping with the facilitation today, so you'll just see me trying to bring the questions into the room. But without any further ado, I'd actually like to ask Kenny Morse, the rector of IG Delft, to give us some introductory welcome remarks for this book launch of Gabriella's books on groundwater law, which uh, is a really nice opportunity to take and celebrate. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you, uh, thank you very much also to everybody uh, online. Uh, I was in the lucky position that I received a copy from uh, Gabriella, and I understood from her that she's a little bit nervous uh, at the moment, which I think she should be, because uh, this is a special event, and I think something like this does not happen uh, so often in your life. So I think you can be proud of yourself and also enjoy the moment. And they're a little bit uh, anxious. Uh, is I think, a good thing to have there. What I uh, think is also quite nice is, I don't know how you managed, uh, because um, uh, we, uh, you probably know our partner of uh, Human Water, that's where the make decisions about uh, which topic should be the World Water Day next year. And uh, I know that uh, when this decision to make groundwater, and uh, Nino and uh, Elisabeth here from IREC, uh, they play also an important role in selecting the topic of groundwater. But how you manage to get your book finished in the year of uh, groundwater, that uh, I need to, to learn from you because uh, I think uh, that's super, super well timed. So uh, I think that's quite nice. And also, um, I think the topic of uh, governing groundwater is, uh, I think, a quite uh, important one. I've been uh, in a number of international conferences, and um, of course in the groundwater year, people will talk about groundwater. But what you notice, or at least that's my impression that is there, that um, there is a bigger and much bigger attention for what you can do with groundwater, how you can use groundwater. And I do think that uh, governing your groundwater system is maybe a bit neglect part of uh, what, what needs to be done. I think on the on the technical side, and I know there are some colleagues here in the room that are quite uh, good at it. Some, some, some experts sitting over there. Uh, but I think that part um, still also requires attention. But on the, the government side, it's even bigger than that. Um, I have not read the full book yet, but reading uh, just through that part, uh, something that uh, really struck me uh, also in one of your conclusions was actually that you also mentioned that uh, in some cases it's not about the lack of investments that uh, hampers actually the development of groundwater in a good way, but in some cases it could uh, even strengthen actually the way how people treat groundwater. So that, uh, and, and not all cases, it's the same issue that pushes it in a positive way or holds it back in a negative way, but that it's very much may depend on the situation. And I think in, in your book, where you are talking about six completely different cases, I think it's a quite nice overview on how and, and uh, what you may expect and think about if you are dealing with one. So with that, I would like to congratulate you again, and also on behalf of uh, maybe all our colleagues of uh, IG here, and I really look forward also to read the, the remainder of the book, but also very much looking forward to, to your presentation of your book. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Eddie. We'll come to the main part, the actual launch of the book now, which is um, the part when Gabriella, Gabriella um, Sara will talk about her book and tell us what she actually found out in her research and what's to learn from it. Gabriela, please. Thank you, Susanna, and thank you, Eddie, and thank you to all of you for coming and joining us in this special event, very special for me at least, to present the, the yeah, my book. And the title of the book, as I mentioned, is Governing Groundwater Between Law and Practice. And this book is a, well, it covers the work that I have been doing in the past. I was counting the years, and then there were like many more than what I thought. So I, around the last 12 years of my life, I thought, okay, PhD four, and then postdoc two is six. But then it's, it was much more than that. <laughs> So, at least for the last past 12 years of my life. And it 
it's also that the book shows a little bit of my journey. So all the case studies that I cover in the book are places where I have lived, where I have worked, and where I have met many inspiring and like hardworking people, the ones that they are really dealing with all the problems every single day. Because of course, for us, even though we know a lot about the topic, it's like somehow, I would say, away from us, but talking with the people that they really experience all these complexities and groundwater problems every single day, for me, that has been the most enriching and interesting part of the whole process. So that's what I would like to focus on on this, on this presentation. So just to say also a little bit about the idea how this book came about, that was in 2017, so five years ago, when I had the, my first meeting with Yoyita, when I started my postdoc here at IG Delft. So I was moving from India. We were living in, in India, my partner is also here. So thank you for coming. And we were, well, I was applying for a postdoc, and then I got the postdoc here, and in my first meeting with Yoyita Gupta, she told me like, so would you like to publish a book? And I was like, yeah, of course, where do I sign? <laughs> and then she said, okay, but first let's finish the postdoc, but then you can bring together everything from your PhD and your postdoc, and then we can write the book. So that's the book that I'm going to be discussing today. So the main purpose of the book is to provide insights into how different people but also communities, organizations, institutions engage with groundwater governing according to their social realities. That includes the weather, the climate change effects, poverty, richness. If it's also the, the legal realities, what kind of legal system do they have? What kind of regulation enforcement do they have? So while at the same time I was examining the law, I said that before, so how law is being drafted, developed, and also implemented, and how this has contributed to the transformation of groundwater governance. So basically, I wanted to look at two things, right? What people do at the very local level, the practices, why they do what they do, and how do they do it, if they protect water, if they pollute water, if they, how do they share water, but at the same time, I was interested in looking at the law, okay, how the more formal structures are also dealing with water. Do we need a permit to extract water? Is everybody having a permit or not? So try to mix these two and try to understand to what extent they are actually linked. And if not, how and why do we have this like, lack of connection between them? the different practices and the different laws and regulations. So my overall research questions were how can the conceptualization and theorization of groundwater law and governance be improved by examining groundwater practices while having equity and sustainability as an entry point? So when I started looking at the law, and I look at different principles and how do we regulate water in different jurisdictions, I realized or I found out that there were two key principles, equity and sustainability. When I mean equity, I'm not only talking about how we humans are we distributing water, but also and to what extent we are thinking about distributing or sharing that water with other non-human creatures. And then sustainability, the same, how we were thinking about using this resource, but also thinking about the future, the, the future generations, and again, about humans, but also other creatures that also need groundwater resources. And then the other big question was, how can the study of groundwater practices, so this is what people do in the everyday lives, can improve the future design of groundwater law? So then to, to make some detailed recommendations that what do we need to do to make good laws or adequate laws to try to address the different problems, the different complexities, the different situations that we have 
currently in many in many parts of the of the world. So just a little bit about the methodology. Well, of course, I started looking at water governance literature, but also political ecology, also groundwater governance, also water justice, equity. Then I was also looking at different water rights and environmental law in all the different countries that I was uh, interested in, in, in understanding. And again, always looking at what were the guiding principles and always finding like these two were at the core of everything, equity and, and sustainability. And also going through international, more global convention, like the Convention of the Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Forces. And then the last aspect that I did or included in my methodology, and the one that I enjoyed the most, was the, the empirical component, so trying, as I said, going to these communities, talking to these people and trying to understand how they govern water, what practices do they use, how do they share their water there in a photo from, from India, people decide, okay, how are we going to use this new well that we created because we needed to, to have this new well in this position, in this place, or well, the other discussion and how are we going to come about with yeah planning to use water in the future and then also in many cases and i will explain this later that's a photo also from from costa rica where people were demonstrating because water has been polluted due to uh, chemical pesticides and all kind of chemicals for agriculture and then one photo of me just talking and interviewing people to try to understand their, their problems and their realities. So now I will go through the case studies. So I will mention a little bit of what did I find there and what were the main problems. And again, with this book, it's not like, okay, after the book I will give people solutions, okay, this is what you have to do to get everything resolved, but more I will share like to understand what was happening and how the people that they are living there manage to, to address the situation or to live and stay with, with the problems that they have because they don't have any other option than that, right, just to stay there, so how they are managing to, to do to, to live with the, with the problems that they have. So the first case study, as I also mentioned, this is a little bit of my journey. So these are the first case studies that I, that I look at from my home country, from Costa Rica. So the first one is the coastal communities of Santa Cruz, which, which are located in the North Pacific of, of Costa Rica. So there, as you can see in the photo, we have very beautiful white sand beaches that is a great place to go on holiday for international and national yeah, tourists. So the whole and Costa Rica weather is nice the whole year. So people go on holidays like the whole year. So of course that has helped also at, with the boom of this, of this kind of resorts like having swimming pools, jacuzzis, golf courts etc that they all demand a lot of water however this is the the driest part of the whole country because where it is located the yeah the rainfall is is very minimum it's like around 400 milliliters while in other country in other parts of the country it's much more than that right so it rains a lot but in this part it's very dry so due to these rainfall patterns is is very, is very common that the rivers, especially during summertime, they are dry. So it's like 99% of the water that people are using there is groundwater. So of course, in order to have more and more development of tourism and real estate, they are drying the aquifers. So on one side, we have this, the, the development of tourism and it's still continue and it's still having the golf courts and all green and all beautiful. However, on the other side, we see the water tanks 
who are taking water to the communities because sometimes, especially in summer when it's not rainy, the communities don't have access to water, right? So then again, this is also to show that this often is not only about, okay, there is a absolute lack of availability of water, but it's a problem of distribution because they are all in the same community. So in one hand you see one water, like abundance of water, and in the other one you see the, the lack of water. So with this, just to give some flavor of what the communities have done to address some of this situation, there the communities have organized themselves through water boards. So all these communities, the, the providers, the water providers in these communities are water boards who are members of the, of the community. So they are trying to negotiate with the government to stop the, the provision of water to the, to the hotels, at least until they have guaranteed their, their, their basic water needs. So now they are in the process of building infrastructure because of course that was also a lack of infrastructure there. So now after many years and many discussions and many also the lawsuits, these people from these communities, in some of the cases where the hotels want to keep getting water, however they know they don't have more water because the, these water, these community water associations are the ones in charge sometimes to approve the water connections, right? So when somebody comes, somebody new comes, like for example, a new hotel, the communities can say, no, we are not going to give you that. So they are trying to stop. Of course, it's not so easy because then they can say, okay, we're going to do it through some other wall, wells. And then the government has allowed that to happen. So it's very complex, but at least just to give you an idea of what the situation is there. But interesting is to say that a lot of legal means have been used through this community like having these water provision services being done by the community and also lawsuits against some of the hotels trying to say, okay, you cannot exploit more water because there is no more water. And they have been even gone to the constitutional court in Costa Rica and they have won a few cases. So it's interesting and I could say much more about this, but I want to share also a little bit of the other ones. So I will move. Then in the Q&A section, you can ask me for anything else that you would like to know. This is the second case study from Costa Rica. So that is in the other side, that is in the Caribbean. So here we have a lot of rain. So the problem is not the lack of, of water or that the rivers are getting dry like the other one, that they were mostly using groundwater. Here they use both water and also surface water. But the problem is, as you can see in the photo, we have been suffering from a pineapple boom also in the last 20 years. Currently, Costa Rica is the main pineapple exporter in the world. And Costa Rica is like kind of the size of the Netherlands. So it's a very, very small, small country. And in all these, in all these communities, what you see is like something like this, like, like what is shown in that, in that photo. So there were like rainforests and everything has been deforested and now it's very common to see this and then you will see this like all the all the expansion of the pineapples there and a lot of use of all kind of chemicals that you can imagine so it's like pesticides and fungicides and everything of course to protect the, the pineapple against the box and everything so all this water is infiltrated into the ground, into the soil, and then it's going to the groundwater. So all the rivers, all the aquifers in these, in these communities have been polluted. So the problem there is that the communities don't have any kind of water that is not polluted. So there is water, but it's, it's completely polluted. So due to that, there have also been a lot of yeah, complaints put into the different government institutions, but also in that place they have been particularly active, the communities, so they have been having a lot of demonstrations. 
So for example, it says there, let's protect the springs of today and tomorrow. So that is something that is common because even though they are being, yeah, they have been, these communities have been complaining for a long time, the problem continues. So when I started researching this, few years ago, the communities already were organizing themselves. And again, they created some legal, legal organizations. So they created an environmental association there in that community to defend from, defend the, the defense of the water by, by pineapple polluters. So they have been also very active going to government institutions and complaining and say, okay, you have to stop this. So one of the big things or the most important legal action that they took is they went to the municipality and the municipality is the, the institution in charge of like, like zoning and planning. So they said, okay, you cannot have more pineapples at least in the upper part where is all the, where most of the springs are located. So at least they want that and the municipality has been very, very supportive of the communities. So that has been also something good that they achieved through legal means. And as I said, also besides or outside the, the legal means, they have been demonstrating often and they have been, some of the demonstrations have been also a little bit heated. And, but again, it's something that is, I have been doing research on this for many years and the situation unfortunately again continues to to grow and the problems of the pineapple expansion in Costa Rica continues to grow and the communities continues to complain but I think at least the important thing is that they are not giving up and as I said with the example of the municipality they have achieved little things to protect the, their water resources and some of the other plantations they also put some environmental litigation against them and they have managed to close one or two because they were like an environmental disaster going on. But of course they closed one and then they opened three more. So again, it's a battle. But again, what I want to show are the problems and the different legal and community organization and community struggles that, that, that are going on to address this this ongoing situation. Then just going a little bit to another part of the work, that's Australia, that's where I first moved to do my PhD. So in Australia, again, maybe just to say that something in common with all these case studies that I am presenting is that they are all in countries that at least we can say that they are democratic countries and that they have laws in place. And to different extent, but they are trying to implement overarching principles such as sustainability or equity in the governance of, of water resources. So here in the case of Angus Bremer in South Australia, I chose that one because when I went to Australia, that was the state with the most modern water regulation, water law. So they were already thinking about, okay, let's bring everything together, not just water, but in this law, and actually they updated the law, now they have a new law from, from last year. And it includes everything, like water, natural resources, landscape, community. So it's a very interesting law from, from that perspective. So then I thought, okay, let's look at an interesting case to, to understand the implementation and the practices in, in South Australia. So in Gankas Bremer, they have a community organization too, that is called the Angus Bremer Water Management Committee. So again, they are trying to understand the different problems that they have. So in this particular case, the, the problem that they are facing is similar to the, to the coastal communities. So there is a lack of water again. There is a, the rainfall there is very, very low and also they have been severely uh, affected by climate change. So they were having less and less water in all this area. So then to, they got to a point in the end of the 80s, 1980s, that 
that they didn't have any water and all and many of the aquifers they go saline water so all the community was very upset and was very worried about that but the interesting or the contrasting part was that over there they they weren't like in the coastal communities where they were let's say external people causing the main damages like the hotels and the development of real estate here they were the same irrigators who lived there that they were exploiting and over exploiting the aquifers but when i was talking to them then they said because we didn't know we were just using and using and using until we realized that yeah we were having a problem so the same irrigator started changing their practices and even the law so they went to the south australia ministry of water and they told them no we want new regulation in our water licenses so for every hectare that we have in, in crops we want to have another hectare with with revegetation and things like that so they started implementing many different kind of of practices and initiatives to improve their yeah their situation and as i said one of those was that to start reforestation but also they started to reduce their own groundwater use so they say okay we are realizing that we have these allocations that sometimes allocation is not the same that when you are using right so you have the right to use this but you are using less so they were saying let's change the allocation so we can use less to the maximum that we are using now and they try to even reduce it further so they started doing that and they also look for different sources of water so not only groundwater but they started using and they also invested a lot of money created infrastructure to bring water from from the angas premier angas river that it was also close there so a lot of things all done by them and then as i said they even went to the ministry to say okay we want to change our our requirements for water licenses and we want to include all these so that's a little bit of what happened also in the in the annual primary case study this is in another state of australia that's in western australia so this case i always introduce it like the least attractive case because it was somehow boring but i thought it was also interesting to show that if everything goes well, people don't really get passionate and they don't get involved as often that, as when there are problems, right? So in this case, even though it's a, they have still a lot of problems there with groundwater resources and there's a lot of research, research showing that because in Australia they, there are several institutions doing a lot of monitoring to see how they the groundwater tables are, are yeah changing and to see how much groundwater is being used and how groundwater is being yeah replaced or not so all that research shows that they are going to have problems very very soon so they know that the groundwater tables are, are dropping so they are already having a problem as i said but the people haven't suffered the problems yet so every time that i was talking to different communities there in the southwest they told me like no no here everything is fine the government which is this one the water corporation so they're the, the ones responsible for for the provision of of water in the southwest they were saying okay here we just have one incident and it was interesting to to hear because they said that the communities became very very vocal because they said that they are going to take their water to supply Perth, which is the, the biggest city nearby. And then the community said, no, we are not going to leave you guys take our water to there. And then the water corporation didn't do it. They stopped that. And then everything again became like relatively smooth and people are fine. And then it shows again, like a more yeah, top down approach of things however as i said people were overall happy with their government responses however i also thought that it was interesting because in western australia that was the oldest 
water law that you have in Australia was from 1914, so it was even older than the one that I had in Costa Rica, that it was for me very, very old because it was from 1949. And in comparison to the one in South Australia, as I said, that they just, uh, they just amendment the law and now they have a new one that it was, is from last year. So again, you see uh, that sometimes, even though the law is old and still there weren't so many problems there. However, some of the recommendations that I get from this particular chapter is that the law needs to be revised. But it still is interesting to see how the community's responses were, were overall okay. Then we moved to India. Then that was the, when I finished my PhD, I went to India and I was working there with an the NGO, with, with Sofecom. So with them, I started understanding a little bit of the situation in Maharashtra. Maharashtra just got a, well, a few years ago, passed a new groundwater law that for India, for the whole country of India, has been an inspiration and many people have said, okay, we need to, to at least within India, and I have here a lot of Indian participants, so we can discuss this a little bit more, but it's, it has been discussed as one of the, yeah, one of the main, more progressive, progressive laws in the country. So there they started again talking about principles such as equity or sustainability and the importance of having these in, in, in the laws. And here in Gibre Bazar, this is also a very, I will say, at least in India, very well-known case. So when I have been with my students and I discuss this, most of the students, they know this case, because it was a community. So all the regulations that they have, they were completely done bottom-up approach, right? So the community said, okay, we, in the 70s, 80s, they were having a lot of problems. They didn't have any water whatsoever. And now that is a picture from a few years ago. They have a lot of check downs now and a lot of reservoirs. And even in summer, if you go, you will see green and you will see water. And all that was made by the community at the very local level, at the panchayat level. So they got a, they even brought back one person from the village to be the head of the panchayat. So I interviewed this person, so it was also very interesting to talk how one person can do so much. And still, when I talk to everybody in the community, because there I had the opportunity to talk to most people, they were very happy still to have him. And they were saying like, yes, because they always told me, okay, when you compare how things are since he got here and before, it's just much better now. So they all want him to be in that community and to keep improving with all. Again, they introduced in the community many practices. They did, they stopped the free grazing, so now that is legal. And that is a photo of that. They were also having a lot of groundwater recharge going on and a lot of reforestation activities. So all that, again, was done from the panchayat level and with all the communities because at the panchayat all the people who are over 18 years old they can vote in the panchayat and participate so all these activities have been done with yeah the approval of 99 percent of the of the people so now my last case study where we are all here now so when i first moved here I told, again, Yoyita, all this research that I was looking at, and she told me, oh, what you are missing there is the problem of groundwater excess. And you will see that in Delft, you have a very good example of that. So I thought, okay, I will start doing research on this. So I started looking and reading, and actually in the newspaper that was very, very active. I don't know if you follow that discussion, but at least in 2017, when I came, it was a very, very hot topic because, yeah, Delft was in danger of being flooded, or I think it still is. So, again, all these cases are ongoing cases, so they're not like final conclusions yet, but at least, as I said, some, 
yeah, some experiences that I have gained or some lessons that I have learned or some experiences that I would like to yeah, share and that's again the reason of the book. So here the main problem is that this company DSM, which is like one or two kilometers away from here, Actually, we went with some of our students, I think two years ago, Klaus and myself, we took the, the students there because we were trying to understand groundwater governance here in Delft. So this, this company, they have been extracting groundwater since 1960. So the first license that they got, it was, so it was a very nice map when they, when they showed me, when Delft was, you know, like just like, 10 houses around the outer Kerk and the newer Kerk, and then how it has expanded and expanded. And of course, they didn't foresee that in 1960. And of course, after over the yeah, 100 years since then, the commute, the, the city of there have grown. However, they were still using so much water and so much water. Until one day in 2014, they just said, okay, we're going to stop using it because now we are very efficient, so we don't need, we don't need to use so much water. So they are still using, but I think like 10% of what they used to, to use. So they say, okay, we are not going to, to stop to use more groundwater, we're going to stop. And of course, as soon as that happened, everybody in Delft got very, very worried. Not only the communities, but also the Mente, also the water board and also the, the province of, of South Holland. So they all tried to take DSM to, well, they took DSM to, a, to the court to say, okay, we have to force them to keep pumping groundwater because if not, all Delft can flood. However, the court said, no, you cannot force anybody to keep pumping groundwater. So if they want to stop, they can stop. However, I would say in a very Dutch way, they say you can stop, but you have to make it organized and you have to plan. So in the end, they gave her like five years to say, okay, you have to, to scale down a little bit, then a little bit, then until you get to that full stop. So then they started doing that. And of course, a lot of things happened in, in between, but then when the final day came and they said, okay, now we're going to stop, then the municipality, the municipality, the water board, and the province of South Poland, they decide, okay, from now on, we need to continue pumping because of course, if we don't keep pumping, we are going to have a lot of problems there. So they continue with that agreement for a few years until at least they were more, let's say there is no complete certainty until today, but at least they saw, okay, we're going to see a pattern to see if we reduce and reduce, they are not going to cause, you know, this won't cause too much damage to the city of Delft. So in the end, they were kind of convinced that that was going to happen. So in the end, the South Holland, the province of South Holland, they left the, the agreement and they said, okay, now it's only the two of you, in the hands of the municipality and the water board and they pay a lot of money so the two of them could continue because they decided that it was good enough. And then the water board did the same thing and they say, okay, we now know that things are doing well. So this, the, just to continue with the monitoring, the Gemente can do it alone. So then I thought, okay, it would be interesting to see what the Gemente has to say about that. And then when I talked to people at the Gemente, what they told me is like, well, basically that happened because we were sleeping. <laughs> That's their response. So you can imagine that the other two, even though they say, okay, now, and there is also, you can see it even online, how the monitoring is going. And apparently, as I said, things are okay. But again, there is no certainty of, of that. And the municipality is the only one that is still involved because as somebody told me, they were sleeping. And now the idea or the plan is to get to a complete stop by 2030. So we are going to see if that happens or how that happens, or if in the end we need to come back to a, yeah, and another agreement with the 
three main government institutions involved. And at the same time, while all that was happening, I also talked to come to the to some people here in Dell that they even created a association. I don't know if anybody who lives there is part of this neighbors association, but they were very, very worried about what's going on. So they have been very active to check that everything continues and the monitoring and they even have said like, okay, if we have any problems or for example, yeah, some flooding happens, we are going to take legal action. So some people were discussing that with me and they were telling me that. So they, I know that they have been some, yeah, again, keep the conversation between this government institution and some of the at least more active neighbors here in Delft who are very worried about what can happen. So they are saying, okay, we are not still sure what's going to happen, but we still have this plan, you know, as a plan B, something happens, we are going to sue them because we know that this is happening because of that. And of course, there is a lot of yeah, responsibility issues that we can still discuss, but I need to move, but we can yeah, discuss that. In the, in the question part. So just to, to conclude, some of my main conclusions is that groundwater governance is a work in progress. We still need to do a lot to, to have or to understand better what it is. And we need to understand that from practices and the law. Then groundwater governance will always be political and it will always be contested. And there is the need to new ways of thinking and addressing groundwater governance and always thinking at the local initiatives and local practices. And then in conclusion, that is something that I created for the book and the main four conclusion for my conceptualization and theorization of groundwater is that we need to look at the context specific. So we need to acknowledge existing practices relating to groundwater then when we think about the law, it's always important to have the core principles of equity and sustainability. The government, the book is also a plea to say the government needs to be involved. I see in all the cases, everything was better when the government was, was involved. Of course, sometimes we need to change some people in the government, but that doesn't mean that that is the government. And then I think we need a better dialogue and a better process between local practices and the law. And it's not only the law need to follow the practice or the practice need to follow the law, but we need to have a dialogue and then we will have, yeah, better groundwater governance. very much the local level of groundwater governance but of course that's all embedded in the in the more global sustainability debate and the different principles of how we govern the environment water and natural resources so we have um Jurita Gupta with us who's also a professor here at IIT but also at UFA whom I'm just trying to convince by looking at her that she will give the uh, five minute input that she had prepared and share some thoughts of how Gabriela's work is actually embedded in the for the global sustainability debate. I did convince her. Now, um, it was a 15 minute presentation that I prepared, and I'm not going to cover it because I don't think there's time given how this uh, has gone. So, let me just tell you a little bit of anecdotes about the story and not get involved with the rest. All I know is uh, Gabriella came to IHE. And after I met her, I stopped eating pineapples. <laughs> because uh, every time I bought a pineapple, it was almost always from Costa Rica. And the story about the, the fight between local people and these big multinationals was more than evident. And so um, what I wanted to actually say a little bit was that um, through history, actually, groundwater is one of the earliest types of water to be governed because it was always in areas where there was no water. So people had to actually dig wells and they had to make rules 
And so it's basically Islamic uh, law, which sort of began with groundwater law, and you see that spread to other communities in the world where there was a shortage of water. So law has always been what the communities did, and then there were some good practices and bad practices, and sometimes the good practices prevailed, and that became the law. Sometimes the bad practice prevailed, and then if that happened, then the people would revolt, and there would be a new law that would be formed. So it was always a circular process. But that circular process came to an end with, for example, conquest or um, colonization. So if you look at conquest and colonization, what you find is that, uh, for example, the English came to India and they said, if you own a piece of land, you own the groundwater all the way to hell and all the way to heaven, you own, you own the air. And um, this law is still there in India. So it is, um, if you are a landowner, you own the water. And if you happen to be a big soft drink company and you buy the land and you pump out the water really fast, you're still the owner of that water because it's all the way to hell. And so even if the farmers around fight it, so when Gabriela's explained to you that it's a lot of it can happen at local level, it can't because sometimes you have to fight the multinational. And fighting the multinational or a, a company from outside the country is really difficult. And the reason why it's difficult is because either they are following Indian law, which is the law of the British on land. And the dilemma for the Supreme Court in this particular case was that if you tell that big multinational, you probably know which drink I'm talking about. <laughs> if you tell that multinational that um, you should not use the water, that means you're basically telling Heineken, Ketchup and everybody else in India, you can't use the water. And that basically means that you are stealing or expropriating their water rights. And then they can sue you in court for massive amounts of money. And so the, the problem is that communities are no longer isolated from this global environment in which we live. And this is now the problem of colonization. No? And um, a few weeks, a few months ago, there was an online debate about India's new water processes and Maharashtra's groundwater law, etc. And no one was talking about this land ownership. And I had it in my presentation. I thought, maybe I've missed something. Maybe, you know, I'm out of date. So at the end, I asked uh, the others, uh, what about the ownership rights in the existing water law? And then the guy from the ministry said, we are not talking about it. It just pretending it doesn't exist. That doesn't work because it's going to hit back. The other thing in relation to multinationals is, um, especially foreign companies, is that um, they cannot just use local law, they can also use international law. So, um, for example, in many cases, what they will say is, we'll come to your country, and this is the Bechtel versus Bolivia case or any of the other cases, We'll come to your country and we'll, we'll provide local people with something or the other, water or mining or whatever, but all of these activities use water directly or indirectly. Then one morning the government decides or the local communities decide this is really polluting, so we have to close it down. And so the communities are right, they want to close it down. And so they try to stop it and then the government suddenly realizes it's got an international contract under a... Um, a law, investment law, which falls uh, under a New York jurisdiction or a jurisdiction somewhere outside the country and essentially they cannot close down the factory without paying that huge amount of compensation and most of this is secret. Um, and you might think this is a developing country problem but it's also a Dutch problem because a, a German company has been is being closed down by the Netherlands for coal for fossil fuel, and they are also in the Dutch, the Dutch government under the international investment law uh, for compensation for closing it down. So this is one of the big problems we have. But one of the interesting stories she brought up was about DSM, because normally the problem is giving too much of permits, right? You give too many permits and you need to withdraw those permits because there's a shortage of water. And the moment you withdraw the permit, the company says, I will going to sue you for compensation. And uh, we've done now 60 countries, so, so she has done four detailed anecdotal stories 
six in detail and global stories. But we did 60 countries, less details to find out in the developing world how these uh, permits work and how these contracts work. And apparently you cannot take the permit back in many countries without paying huge amounts of compensation to that company, whether it's a pineapple producer or it's a soft drink or a hard drink or a mining company. So it's very difficult for governments to cope with this. But to come to the DSM case, which is completely different. Here a company says, bye bye, and I'm going off. And now the problem is that the municipality has to pump out the water to make sure that the city doesn't get flooded. So who's going to pay the bill in this case? Technically, it should be the municipality because it's the other story. And it's interesting to see how it has developed in her, her particular case. But I also wanted to, um, and I don't, I'm not going to show you the sheets, are so complex and slightly, uh, is that um, you were talking about in one of the cases about the human right to water and uh, in the Costa Rica case, the first case you discussed, and the needs for other kinds of investments, tourism, etc. Um, we've scaled that up to the global level. So we looked at um, what would happen in 2018, so before COVID, if you provided everybody with uh, access to food, water, uh, energy and infrastructure. Um, so we're talking about more than one third of the world's population that doesn't have access. So in an unequal world in 2019, um, 18, sorry, unequal world, you're polluting so much, what would happen if you added uh, this access? Would that increase your CO2 emissions? Would it increase your groundwater use? Uh, would it increase your pest, um, phosphate and nitrate discharges, etc.? And what you basically see, you cross all the boundaries. And uh, so we gave all the calculations. We worked out what the human right is, and we worked it out in terms of how many calories or how much drinking water. Then we calculated it all into CO2 and then temperature change, or into phosphorus use and the Boundary boundaries. Anyway, to cut a long story short, uh, basically the message is if you want to meet the SDGs on social issues, you, there's no option but to redistribute water, which is also the story you're bringing up, which is about equity and justice. But to end on a little bit of an ironic note, when it went for review, the reviewers came back and said, but you don't discuss technology. And we wrote back to them saying, but we're talking about 2018. Because every time that you talk about 2050, people say, oh, technology will solve the problem. And we were saying, in 2018, technology cannot solve the problem. So unless you can tell me how we can do it. And in 2023, it can't solve the problem. So, you know, you can't postpone meeting the basic needs of people and meeting planetary boundaries ad infinitum because you think technology will mean that law doesn't have to redistribute. It's a very big challenge, and I needed that, and I won't show my sheets. Thanks, uh, Juita. We have some time for questions, either from the room, and I also have some help to see what's online in terms of questions, but maybe we start with the room. Questions, comments, you want to know more about a certain case study? It's your chance. I have a lot of questions, but I'll hold back for now <laughs> to give you the, the chance. Or we can go and start the trains and we can... No, that's the question they need to be learned first. I'll keep you here until there are at least three questions for Gabriela to answer. No drinks before that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, thanks, Gabriela. Congratulations uh, again. I was wondering if among the case studies that you compared, you also look at how could you say equity is grounded in environmental law or should be. And I was wondering, what is it in these countries, in these different countries? I, I, I just heard about the Indian example and I think there it seems to be. And then it's probably on different levels also, like centrally. So how, how would you say that the, that, that equity and sustainability aspect as well is already there or are many of these environmental laws immature and actually do not know or are not even aware of how you would address equity you know? yeah thank you Tima, for, for the question i mean yeah that's also a question that i had and that's why i wanted to look at that 
and you will see that in many different legislations it will take you some time to find equity because it's not like you know with sustainability is different and actually i made a detailed case of all the laws in the book and then you will see sustainability is out there it's like okay we need sustainable use we need sustainable yield we need to so it's clear but with equity it's always like okay equity through participation for example or equity through needs to reallocate some things when this has happened and have but it's always like so yeah it's very blurry and you need to go into all the legislation and read it like almost with you know like yeah which maybe that's why it's the most difficult to apply or why don't you don't see back in practice exactly that is why it's very i mean there are always mechanisms as i said but you need to look very very into all the laws and with a lot of detail to find it but yes it's it's not there like, okay, we need to have this or this redistribution or this, you know, equity as defined as this is not the case. And interesting, if you compare it with sustainability, sustainability is always out there, right? That, I don't know if it's just because it's more fashionable or it's just easier. Exactly, it's easier. So it's okay, sustainable use. Let's say we are going to, you know, in some legislation, you will say, you will see that Okay, sustainable use is like you don't use the aquifer more than its own recharge capacity so that is just easier so but equity is like how do we be sure that water is being used in an equitable way so that is more complex so yeah the law also finds that and then they put like in different ways and if I can just add to what you said because uh, the, the, the human right to water has been there in most cultures and so that's just only for that 50 liters to 100 liters per day storyline. But before the Anthropocene began, it was just small uses, so there was not so much competition. But with the Anthropocene and industrialization, then you see the big users just sweeping up the water, and that's when the inequity came. And that inequity has, we still have to fight on that. Yeah. It's, it's well, a working it problem. complex and sustainability. And if they both involve redistribution, if we need to redistribute between uh, humans and, and non-humans in order to not exceed planetary boundaries, it's also promoted. Yeah. yeah, no, of course it is. I'm just saying that in the laws, you, it's yeah. easier to find because with sustainability, they found, okay, very simple. If you use the recharge, you know, the, the aquifer, less than its own recharge capacity, then it's sustainable. So, so you why do you think it is simpler for lawmakers or policymakers? Because I think with equity, they cannot give, you know, like this kind of formula, you know, you can just use that. With equity, we cannot just say, okay, give everybody the law that they need, even though we have with the human right to water. So everybody has the right to do that. And in many legislation, you will find it. But to apply it is much more difficult. And the sustainability, of course, is also difficult. We are seeing many problems. But I would say that somehow is better, in better shape, Let's say that the other one. Your next book. Yeah. <laughs> I had I've seen two more questions. There was <coughs> you have a question? No. Okay, then it was you, Amit, and then you uh, congratulations on the book and I want to problematize that notion of uh, especially when we talk about uh, the India case study in Hebrew Bazaar. Uh, for example, the constitution would guarantee protection around caste and class in terms of accessing groundwater compared to perhaps what the community organization would, especially around caste, mm -hmm. in terms of who gets to access groundwater and who doesn't, especially the landless and uh, others. So I'm trying to understand how does the contradiction work where equity at the local level, where there's laws that emerging from is also very problematic in the yeah. way it's being conceptualized. But the constitution actually guaranteeing protection. Yes, for, for, for the Indian case study, I put a lot of attention to that. And actually in the book, I put it like that. Like when we talk about equity, it's very, very difficult to think, okay, communities are a very good example for, for this or community practices because of all practices of injustice and caste and discrimination by many different castes, only one, but gender and many different so yeah that that is definitely there but in this particular case they also address like in the same way that the constitution does they also address because i also even talk to landless people there and Dalit, 
and they always said like okay no we are we don't have wells here in our but we are able to use because they have they don't have private wells they have community wells so everybody can use them so they can also use it of course there is no complete equity because they don't have land while most of the other ones they have but to what to access water and i, I explained that in the book they can have the access to to this community walls and they use the water that they need so they still have the water needs completely you know like guarantee in that particular case in Hebrew Bazaar so it's very very interesting to see because those contradictions as I said are there in India everywhere but in this particular case that's why it's such a like yeah emblematic case because they are also taking into account that gender and caste and try to redistribute as in the best way they can and I think again the leader of the community Popatrao Pavar I also asked uh, interview him and ask this particular question and he is you know like on top of that so that is something that is happening very locally. Thank you for the question. You first, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, congratulations, Gabriela. I have two questions. One is uh, uh, do you, have you seen across the case study uh, if uh, centralized or decentralized system is key for uh, uh, improving the situation of the governance on, on the ground. And the second one is that do you think or have you seen in the different case study if knowledge or understanding of the of what is happening uh, of the ground water process and etc. Uh, by the local community also um, is key or can can improve their ability to not to solve, but to, to deal with the groundwater problems. Yeah, let's go to the first one first. And I will say that in all the cases and with all the knowledge that I have so far, I will always recommend decentralized way because in the end, groundwater is a very local resource. And again, people know their wells, people know their water resources, their groundwater resources, they know how to use it, they know if there's a problem, they will feel it immediately. So I think the more that you can decentralize that, it will be the best. And of course, at the national level, or even at the international level, I will always suggest, let's have these guiding principles, again, like equity or sustainability. But the more day-to-day, -day, how are we going to implement this, or how equity will look like here, it has to be at the very decentralized way. And the second question, sorry, I forgot. No, but knowledge, uh, understanding, of, because uh, it's, I think it's sometimes difficult for the communities to understand what is happening uh, or the, with their resource and uh, to have the right fight. <laughs> yes, that, that is also a yeah, very interesting point because that was one of my first like entry questions for them. Okay, how is the situation here? with groundwater. So I saw that when there is a problem, people just get involved and they look for information. And I think all of us we will do the same, right? If suddenly you open your tap and you don't have water, you will just go and look for information. That's really, no? <laughs> yes, but I will say that people react very late for everything. If no, we will be doing, if no, we wouldn't get to that point. If we were doing things, you know, in the right manner to begin with. But what I saw from all these people that I talked, and again with the, my boring case that everything was kind of, they're not doing really anything because it was like, yeah, the government is fine, we don't have problems. Just one day they have one big thing, but most than that, it was okay. So yeah, I think when, yeah, when they have problems, when they have the, the so-called crisis, is when people start wondering, okay, what is happening? And, for example, with the irrigators in Australia, that I say they were the same ones causing their problems because when there's somebody else, it's more complex. But in that case, I told them and they told me like, we didn't know, we were just using and using and using and we thought we were having water forever. Well, did we have the problem is that we thought, okay, we need to do something. And then we started doing research and we told the government, you have to come and teach us. And then they got the expert from the government, like hydrogeologists and, hydrologists and a lot of people 
teaching them, okay, how the aquifers work and how they recharge and how all that. And then they were building this knowledge that then they just took it to the next level. And this when they started doing a lot of these activities to, okay, we are going to do many different things. Yeah, I just want to nuance her, uh, her previous answer. Because in ancient Islamic law, they basically said, uh, if you have a well with water and your neighbor's well is dry, another community, you must share. And the problem is if you decentralize too much, those who have the water will not share with those who don't have. So I, I, I seriously think not total decentralization because it will be it will be just like with the problem that we're having now with the uh, with the international uh, groundwater law that countries are saying this is my water groundwater I'm not going to share it with you and 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 you have to watch out for that. So I would say you still for the sharing aspect you may need to go beyond completely decentralized. Yes, no, that's what I said. I think mainly decentralized, but there has to be, you know, something national about equity or, or distribution or even, yeah, taking it to the next level. Yeah, like, yeah, avoiding, you know, pollution or deforestation or, of course, there has to be something broader. But I think for the day to day, you know, how much groundwater can they use, the permits that they do that it is very, very local. Because for example, one of the people that I was talking to in Costa Rica, they were telling me, oh, to drill this, well, I need a permit, but I need to go to San Jose. And for me, that is the entire day. I can never take a day off, so I'm using water without a permit. So if they were having something more local, maybe there will be better. So but that's not decentralization. That's simply making facilities available. So let's keep that. Let's <laughs> <Yes. laughs> maybe also take one more question before we move to the drinks. You had a question. It's not actually a question, but first of all, congrats on the book. And it's just for the Indian case of Hitler Bazaar and the uh, discussion around equity and sustainability. Like, like we see that it's very difficult to get equity in terms of it cannot be quantified, right? But why, why in sustainability gets picked up in policies is because it's not only related to indicators of groundwater recharge, but what happens, what caught the case of this uh, specific case is that now there people had like the per capita income of around 12 US dollars in 1990. Now they have a per capita income of around 450 or 500 US dollars. So that picked up a case. It's about a case about 60 million years in a village and only three or four families below the poverty line. So that picked up the case and then it got more government talking into it, like why it happened and everything. And then the Popatlal Pawar, the uh, Sarpanch, he is now appointed as the head of 100 villages to replicate the same model yeah. only based on the sustainability of what he achieved during the model. Mm -hmm. So it's not only, about, I think, about the uh, aquifer indicators, but also about other indicators such as you know income level or everything. Yeah. That increase only in this particular case, but we are not sure without studying the equity case if it is sustainable in 100 other villages as well. Yes, no, thank you for adding that, because yeah, in the case of India, that, that's, that was the case, right? Not just the improvement, improvement regarding water, mm -hmm. but everything, productivity. Now they even have like cheese, they want yeah. not cheese, um, sorry, paneer, <laughs> and they have a brand. So it's like in Rebazar, like, we know, with a community development and this and that. So all these things are also benefiting this community. A lot of people coming to see them when I was there, in, in many rural communities in India, when I was there, they were always like looking at me like, hey, somebody weird. But in that one, they were so used to foreigners. It was like, oh, yeah, you come. And actually, they took me to, they have like next to the, next to the temple, they have like a big place full of all the prizes that he rebasar. I don't know if you have been there, but they have like prizes for the best community initiative for this, for this. So it's like a very, very... So yeah, a lot of things are also happening beyond groundwater recharge and sustainable use of groundwater. Do we have any questions left or is everyone waiting for the drinks? <laughs> Not that we couldn't continue the discussion over drinks. So I would I would suggest we, we leave it at that. Um, there will be drinks in the cafeteria and the bar area, but before we go there, um, congrats again. <laughs> participating online, I'm not sure which camera it is, but thanks a lot. <laughs>